Hi, it's Dr. Katherine Harris for English 10 Great Works of Literature, Techno Literature. This is the continuation. Now let's continue talking about that final chapter 7 in A Clockwork Orange in part 2. So the language source is revealed as um, no others talk like this and Alex is more as a political rebel than anything else. And we see this on page 129. Dr. Brandon is having a conversation with the governor. Uh, this is midway down. It says, quaint, says Dr. Brodsky, like smiling, the dialect of the tribe. Do you know anything of his provenance, Branham? Odd bits of old rhyming slang, said, said Dr. Branham, who did not look quite so much like a friend anymore. A bit of gypsy talk, too, but most of the roots are Slav. Propaganda. Subliminal penetration. The irony is that they, aren't they also doing the subliminal penetration themselves? Right. We all want Alex to get better. That's what Burgess describes in his introduction. Uh, he becomes a sympathetic character in Chapter 4, page 113. Or maybe not for you. I don't know. Didn't you think he was sympathetic after watching that torture scene? Let's go over to 113 itself. He's describing what was happening to him. Uh, 113 on the bottom, he says, If I was to be a free young mall chick again in a fortnight's time, I would put up with much in the meantime. Oh, my brothers. One vesh I did not like, though, was when they put, like, clips on the skin of my forehead so that my top glass lids were pulled up and up and up, and I could not shut my glasses no matter how I tried. I tried to smack and said, This must be a real horror show film if you're so keen on my videoing it. And one of the white coat vex said, smacking, Horror show is right, friend. He didn't know what was going to come for him by that point. And then he becomes on display over on page 137. This is in chapter 7 itself. This is after he's been let go and he's walking around and he, he becomes the, the uh, almost like... Um, the creature in Frankenstein, in, in uh, Young Frankenstein, not in the original one. He's being displayed after he's been let go and he's supposedly been cured. Uh, there was the Saja governor and the holy man, the Charlie or Charlies as he was called, and the chief Chasso and this very important well-dressed Chelovec who was the minister of the interior or interior. All the rest I didn't know. And so they start looking at him. When he vided me come... He, me coming in, he said, Aha, at this stage, gentlemen, we introduce the subject himself. He is, as you will perceive, fit and well nourished. He comes straight from a night's sleep and a good breakfast, undrugged, unhypnotized. Tomorrow we send him with confidence out into the world again, as decent a lad as you would meet on a May morning, unvicious, unviolent, if anything. And then the rest of chapter seven goes on to chronicle the sheer torture of Alex's life. And in fact, at some point, he's going to try to kill himself, and he can't because it makes him sick. What we really have here in the development of his character is a loss of identity. There's no chance at reform for Alex. What they've done is given him um, biological subliminal messages in response to any thoughts that he has. He doesn't have really free will anymore. And it's the irony of the word and the use of horror show. First, he says it at the beginning in chapter one and says, well, really, what trouble are we going to get into tonight? tonight? That's what he means. And then on 126 in chapter six of part two, he uses horror show in reference to himself and the films that he's about to watch. He says, stop it, stop it, stop it. I keep on creeching out. It was the next day, brothers, and I had truly done my best a morning and afternoon to play it their way and sit like a horror show, smiling, cooperative malchick in the chair of torture. He's become the horror show instead of dishing out being the horror show itself. Uh, it's torture that's reversed onto Alex himself. Now, the films, where do they come from? Who made them? Ostensibly, it's the government who's made them, as he's describing them. They're really sinister. So the question to ask ourselves is, is the gov government really helping? Where did they get these films from, and did they make them themselves in the destruction of other people? And how are they any different from Alex himself? Are they just trying to conform Alex to their idea of goodness? The free of violence when they're showing him films that they probably made from very violent acts. The dreams he has in part two offer another sense of foreshadowing, but they become nightmares. And we see this come up on page 124 in chapter five. 
at, at the bottom of 124, he talks about dreaming and not necessarily, there's, it's not fear anymore, it's that the Ludovico te technique has infected him. What was even funnier was when I went to sleep that night, oh my brothers, you guys are oh my brothers now, I had a nightmare and as you might expect it was one of those bits of films I'd videoed in the afternoon, a dream or nightmare is really only like a film inside your Gulliver except that it is as though you could walk into it and be part of it and he continues on. So he dreams of violence and he wakes up because it's made him feel sick. The Ludovico technique has worked. Um, it becomes um, this device that really is a representation of behavioral modification for Alex himself. Now, we see evidence of the Ludov Ludovico technique working on 142. Sex, if for him, means violence and rape. It doesn't mean anything else. I'm not sure that he can ever be reformed from that. They're not taking these thoughts out of his head. They're merely... merely rewiring the reaction to it. So on 142, he sees some woman and he starts talking about her physicality and her, and her sexuality and what he wants to do to her. And he calls it the good old in and out. Uh, and what happens immediately is that he starts to get sick. And on 143 at the very top, the sex and the violence are still intermingled together because that's what it means to him. But he starts performing what he think his brain and his body wants to know and talking about her in terms of poetry and, re and revising what he's saying. So he's doing um, cognitive dissonance. He's actually not changing his behavior. He's changing, trying to change his thought process, and then hopefully his body will react to that change and, be, and become, offer a different behavior. He's not reformed, in my opinion. I don't know if you think that he is at that particular moment. He couldn't just be attracted to her. He had to suggest something savage, the in and out, so that's not changed. Uh, he can't even be attracted or feel sexual desire for a woman, and it stems from this real negative view of, of women themselves. Uh, supposedly, as the readers were supposed to sympathize with him even more at this particular point. I'm not sure if you do. Alex goes through a series of betrayals. His betrayal by a society by his own group, by his own mind and body. Uh, he betrays himself as the retrospective narrator on page 131 in chapter 6. And he says, less than a fortnight, oh my brothers and friends, it was like an age. It was like from the beginning of the world to the end of it. To finish the 14 years with remission in the stasia would have been nothing to it. So we get evidence of the retrospective narrator having regrets for making this choice. Every day it was the same. And this, is the, this is the only kind of remorse that he has in his retrospective narrative. I don't know if that works against him as our protagonist. I don't, do you see him as a hero at this point? Mm, something for you to think about. We again return to this idea of nature versus nurture. Is violence innate? For Alex, it seems to be. Um, on 128... In chapter 6, it's Dr. Branham who's speaking midway on the page. It says, It can't be helped, said Dr. Branham. Each man kills the thing he loves, as the poet prisoner said. Here's the punishment element, perhaps. The governor ought to be pleased. We're talking about that scene where Alex is admitting that he likes music and that this is going to be the punishment for him, that music will be used to brainwash him and make him sick. Alex cries not because of, of violence, but because he, he will miss committing it. And we see this on page 133, midway through this long paragraph. He says, except, of course, brothers, that this time Ludovico stuff was like a va vaccination, and there it was cruising about on my crabby so that I would be sick always, forever and ever, amen, whenever I vidied any of this ultraviolence. So now I squared my rod and went boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, and the tears like blotted out what I was forced to vidy in like all blessed runny silvery dewdrops. A part of his life has gone up until he was 15. It was just violent. We turn to 135 at the very bottom. He says, And what brothers I had to escape into sleep from then was the horrible and wrong feeling that it was better to get the hit than give it. If that vec had stayed, I might even have liked presented the other cheek. Reformed? I don't know. We want to talk about free will. Free will. There's a difference between choices. On 141 in chapter 7, we talk about choice and morality. 
right? This good and evil down at the very bottom. It says, you have no cause to grumble, boy. You made your choice, and all this is a consequence of your choice. Whatever now ensues is what you yourself have chosen. And the prison Charlie creeched out. Oh, if only I could believe that. And you could biddy the governor, give him a look like meaning that he would not climb so high and like prison religion as he thought... He would, then loud again, arguing started, then I could sloshy the slow of love being thrown around, the prison Charles himself creeching as loud, and it goes on about this idea of love and choosing the, the more, making that good moral choice. You can't love yourself alone if you can't love others. That's the sense of morality that the chaplain is talking about, and he's talking about it all throughout. Now, the issue here is who is Alex by the end of part two. And this is your second blog post. I've talked a lot about Alex's character development in part two. So this will be the second half of the same blog post with the same tag, a clockwork orange. And here's your question, 200 to 300 word response using quotes or summaries um, to tell me your thoughts. How is the Alex of part two different from the Alex of part one? 200 to 300 words. Don't just summarize me, summarize, give me your critical thoughts about this particular one. All right. The, you have the due date for this particular blog post on the schedule. Check it. Uh, and um, we will get back to you with commentary about a clockwork orange and to give you your points on it. Good luck.